I want her to be attracted to me again. I want my wife to have true affection. I don't want to negotiate affection because I hear that doesn't work, right? I don't want to just negotiate what she does for me. I want her to naturally be attracted to me. That's our topic here today. Raise her affection in your marriage with masculine polarity. I'm going to speak about this with Cynthia Cruz, of course, here. And I'm Jeff Allen. This is the C-Note show where we talk about marriage and relationship and intimacy in, in long-term relationship because you want to learn how to love and lead. This call is for men in long-term relationship. And many men know that loving is an art. Not only is it a science, which we talk about here, of course, but loving is an art. Loving and being loved is an art. And that's what we unfold here with Cynthia. Cynthia and I teach level three relationship, deep conscious intimacy, not just how to be physically attractive or intellectually attractive, but how to grow something deep together that's lasting for the long term. Last time we spoke about, I'm afraid to love again and get hurt. So what's next? If you're watching this recording, that was our previous call. So go back and watch that one if you if you like. And today, raise her affection in your marriage with masculine polarity. Okay, what is masculine polarity really quickly? The bottom section, the very foundation of this work that we teach is masculine frame. And masculine frame has three pieces. So we call it the kingly life path framework. And also how to get love back in your life. The, the very foundation masculine frame is breaking codependence, resetting masculine and feminine polarity, and growing a powerful self-worth. And today we're going to talk about polarity, masculine and feminine polarity. From this book, The Masculine in Relationship by G.S. Youngblood, which we recommend to all of our clients and my one-on-one clients as well, this, this one paragraph from the introduction Men can fully inhabit their masculine power and honor women. Women can be powerful and lead their lives as they see fit and offer their feminine energy as a gift to their man. But a fear of being ostracized as a misogynistic asshole holds some men back. And this is why we have a generation of, quote, nice guys and women are left wondering where all the real men are. Another book, Way of the Superior Man by David Data, your sexual essence is your sexual core. If you have a more masculine sexual essence, you would, of course, enjoy staying home and playing with the kids, but deep down, you're driven by a sense of mission. You may not know your mission, but unless you discover this deep purpose and live it fully, your life will feel empty at its core, even if your intimate relationship and family life are full of love. If you have a more feminine sexual essence, your professional life may be incredibly successful, but your core won't be fulfilled unless love is flowing fully in your family or in your intimate life. And sure, there's these yin and yang uh, posters, so to speak, of feminine and masculine, and we could talk about this, but I want to actually focus on the bottom section here, the, the negative part of yin and yang, the negative, so to speak, part of feminine and masculine, which is what happens when they're in excess. So if we have too much yin as a man or a woman, but as a man we're talking about here today, we become needy and confused and we tend to play the victim and or martyr ourselves, or become overly dramatic about we're such the bad guy and I need to go just be the workhorse and we become emotionally needy and confused. And if we're in a masculine or yang excess, we become forcing, rigid, no emotion, just stillness and stonewalling, or we attempt to dominate or push or force things. And we don't want either of those. We don't want either of those in our lives. So I'll talk about this graph here next, but I want to go over to Cynthia. So Cynthia, what do you see in a man when he becomes confused, especially over here, and then emotional and needy and, and plays the martyr versus what a woman is wanting from her man is to be uh, more assertive and initiating and taking action in the world. So what's what do you see there? Let's start to open this discussion. It's a big one today. What do you see of a, a woman who wants her man to lead? She wants him to take action, but she doesn't want him to be confused or needy or play the victim. Let's start us off there, please. Yeah, I guess first I just want to call out on the table that sometimes I feel an ache when looking at this information and what the masculine has to move through in this world, the the woods you have to plow through because there's so many conflicting messages about what 
women are needing, wanting, what the feminine is needing and wanting. And it is incredibly confusing. I do see that women have a shadowy side, uh, that when they experience the masculine in their life in more of that needy, confused whether it's just tell me what you want to make you happy or don't understand where she's coming from and kind of turn away. When she experiences that, there is a hurt and an ache in her heart. And there's even a hunger there because she often doesn't even know what she wants that's different. She often doesn't even know that what she wants is leadership, is your container. And and that's part of why it gets so confusing. So why might she not know that? Why might she not know that's what she wants? Yeah, I mean, we could talk in the broad picture of approximately this generation of women growing up with very different messages uh, about not being weak, about always being strong. And so they kind of stuff some more of those natural, really powerful, wonderful parts of the feminine down. And then and then in, in the confusion, there might be women who have been open to that or think they're opening to that through different parts of their life and then experience something that's like, oh, that's so painful. I, I guess I can't trust that. And then they get a barrier, almost a shield in front of them. Of, I, I never want to feel the ache and the pain of not having that ever again. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know many men here can relate to this. We want to hear your questions, of course. So we want you to come in and ask questions as we go along. So I'll take a step forward, punch in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. And we're happy to go over to your, your question, your story. We want to hear it. So this graphic briefly on the left, you see in the y-axis are security security triggers, providing for her and the family, time together, attention of her. These are security triggers. And attraction triggers on the x-axis here are physique, your physique, how hot's your body, right? Your ability to verbally play with her and a strong social circle, say outside of her, outside the family. And if we are offering no security and no attraction, that's the ick a woman feels, right? If we're offering all security, providing time together, attention, but very low attraction, then it's boring to her. If you're the fun guy, but not offering any security, which most men here are not in that spot, but if you're the fun guy with no security, no time, you're not giving her any time, you're not giving her any relationship attention, you're not providing for her, and it's all attraction. That's a fun guy, but that's not most men here. And what women are really looking for is both of these variables, right? They're they're wanting time, time and attention, providership, but also wanting to be physically attracted, also wanting the play between the two of you, and also wanting to, let's say, look up to you or feel the chemistry between the two of you. So Cynthia, most guys ask the questions around these attraction triggers. And for instance, how can she be attracted to me if I don't give her more time? Or if we're not together, how can she be attracted to me more? You know, many women in this spot that are confused or I love you, but I'm not in love with you or sex isn't happening. They'll say, just give me more space. Just give me more space. And they're actually telling the man to back off these security triggers back mm -hmm. off. But the men, men are always asking that question. Well, how can she be more attracted to me if we don't see each other? Mm -hmm. So what's your take initially on these different variables here, security versus attraction? Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would have recognized there are energetic patterns in different women that are, some are more attached, some are more avoidant. But if we go down to those deeper triggers, there is inherently a way that any of us hold our own value and our own worth when there's like a cultivated time we pull for ourselves versus a choice to spend with the other. And so even if the woman you're with is, is angry or very avoidant or very sad, if she feels like she just gets to have your masculinity whenever she wants, whenever the emotion stirs her, or even if even if she's shut down and, and shut away, it just is there the platter for her to take. 
there is a, a survival instinct in her that recognizes maybe she, she tends to devalue what you're offering because perhaps she feels like there's an abundance and there is something very human that happens when there is scarcity. It reminds me of like the part of the U.S. history of the gold rush. I mean, how propelled were people to move across the West to get gold and now it is such a regular thing that it can be tossed in the trash. So let's use that analogy of the gold rush to go, let's go a level deeper. So what I just showed with this graphic is what we call level one, instinctual desires, some of the more obvious things, let's say, right? But if you as a man don't know how to verbally play, if you don't have a strong social circle, if you're 200 pounds overweight, if you're 100 pounds overweight, that's not a good thing, right? So you want to you want to address these things first. And if you're spending too much time with her, if you're codependent together, we want to fix that too. But in this call, I want to get into the deeper level three with Cynthia right now. So let's say I it's uh, 1885, I think is about when most of the gold rush happened. So let's say it's the late 19th century, or 19th century yeah, late 1800s. And I'm going to go try to find gold because of what it's going to provide for me and the money that it's going to provide but I, as a man, have a mission for adventure. It's not just about the gold. It's I need to direct my life. I just have a yearning to direct my life. I, I want to feel on fire. I want to go fight the dragon. I want to go conquer and bring home you know, the gold literally in this example. And what is it about that fire or that adventure that's attractive? And, and I want to get into more of the energetic or the spiritual ideal of polarity. So what is it that draws a, a woman to a man when he has an adventure in his life? What's that about? Yeah, energetically, I mean, so the opposite of that, just like I would imagine you don't want to experience a woman who's her energy is just pushing against and hardened, like that's such a turnoff. A woman who experiences a lack of mission in the masculine or there's nothing that he's really pulling him, it will feel like loose energy, uh, like a limp noodle trying to hold on to and that doesn't turn her on. Whereas there's, there's something about how you hold yourself, how the masculine holds himself that's so sturdy and powerful it's almost like she can feel the muscular chur of you beneath the muscle she can feel a strong force in you that's compelling if not something she knows she can lean against uh, it's something that's real and it doesn't push away if she's trying to touch into it and let's say from there i'm a man that's on that adventure well i want a woman who's doing and men would say, well, what kind of work is the woman doing? If I'm if I'm doing all these attraction things and security things and have adventure and feel inspired, like what the hell is she doing? What's her responsibility? And we talk about moon goddess, for instance. I want a woman to want to, let's say, worship me sexually. Mm -hmm. I want her to see the God that's flowing through me. I want her to respect me. I want her to look up to me. And What's a woman's practice? What's a woman's responsibility there, for instance, as the moon goddess in his life or what other metaphor you might use? Let's go there. Hmm. Yeah. So level one, I just I want to say it is really hard to speak out. Oh, a woman will feel the energy and you be limp because I'm very aware of how we as women can get hard and pushed out and not be in a devotional space. I think part of women's work is devoting energy that allows the yearning inside of her. And so she will always be yearning for you. There, and there's a devotion in that that isn't with criticism or blame. And I think where a lot of women get stuck is they hear devotion, they hear worship, and it instantly means to them that they are disempowered and that they're being told what to do and they don't have a voice. And if we talk about level three, it's really that that's their power. Because I would imagine you might share with me, you've experienced the devotional love, the yearning of the feminine, whether it is a woman you're with or a woman you've experienced and how how powerful that is, how igniting that is, how 
much that brings to the masculine. And so many women, 99.9% of women don't know that and have never experienced actually giving that in a way that felt incredibly powerful. So I'm going to pause here. I'd like you to unmute yourself and come in. Tell us what's resonating with you or what question you have so far, and then we'll take a step forward. So, so the, the thing that struck me the most, and Jeff, we've, we've talked a little bit about it is like the, I guess it's the social circle, like me trying to find my challenge and my adventure in my life. Before we were here, I was constantly doing things. You know, I was, I, I had a, a handful of friends that I, I fished with on a regular basis and had things I was excited to do uh, when it comes to, to that part. And I think since we've been in this, in this spot, I've kind of let all that kind of go, you know, not, not out of like a, a needy, I'm, I'm trying, I'm here, I'm waiting, but I just, I don't have any passion to go do any of that stuff right now. So I feel like I know in my case, I don't, I don't have that, you know, I've got the physical attraction part going well. I'm in the gym constantly. I'm, I mean, I put on 15 pounds and, and I, I look great. I feel great. I'm doing a good job of, of the masculine frame and just being there and being present and, and being the watchtower and staying calm and not being reactionary. But I'm sucking at the social circle and and just being the fun guy as well. So I don't know. I guess how do I? I know I got to find that in me. But what? Where in the world do I start with that? I don't want to go fish anymore. I I don't want to get on my boat. I don't feel like hanging out with those same friends in that way. So I think I suffer. I suffer there. I think the other the other part of of security. I, I'm I'm great. You know, great provider. I listen really well now. You know, I'm I'm doing fantastic in that in that in that frame so I guess that's that's kind of my question and then how is that impacting her to be more attracted to me you know I know again I know she's physically attracted to me because she makes comments about you know oh did you have arms today your arms look good and oh look you put on weight you look you know she tells me that rarely but you know she and then I catch her like glancing and you know like looking me up and down you know because I do I look a lot better uh so yeah that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So the couple of questions briefly, where can you search next for your edge is what I'm hearing. And if it's, if you're not inspired to go fish or have a poker night, which is put into the chat, which is a great idea or do some other stuff with guys, it might be an internal journey. It might be. So let me say it this way. There's three phases that men often cycle through in our lives. One is external success. Number two is internal awareness or learning about ourselves internally and then service to the world. So money and power and prestige, you know, outside of us, right? More egoic things to, so we can buy and provide, but have money and power and, and this kind of influence. And then it's internal journey. Well, why did I bring forward what I did from childhood or who am I as a person, the internal journey? And then it's serving the world. How can I go serve the world volunteer? And men often circle through those three so I would, part of your homework, say your answer to your question, your number one question is, where is your edge in one of those three things? If you don't feel inspired to do to go do something outside of yourself, if you don't feel inspired to learn about yourself, go volunteer. That's the short answer there. And so how, if a man's on that journey, he knows he wants to find his edge in one of those three ways that I just said, mm -hmm. how is that potentially attractive? And then what about the question in the chat here? What about the wife who isn't inspired by a masculine passion or an endeavor? A woman who isn't devoted to the man's excitement about life, who isn't turned on by it. So what would be attractive about his edge in one of those ways? And then what about a woman who's not inspired by that? Mm. Yeah, I guess the first about, about the edge, one thing that hit me as you were talking is there's a lot of doing that I, I, sometimes I experience the masculine can be the, in this do the sport, do the thing. And it's an, it just an, it's not just a, it's a, a, an outward action. And, and sometimes women will feel that outward action that's not connected to the in the inside as they won't they won't feel the mission or purpose or the the deeper pull of that and so when i experience edge in the masculine there's the i'm doing the outside things but it's also because of the internal connections work personal challenge edge it put, it puts in my heart and in my guts and and for her that kind of 
sparks in her brain that, oh, this is, this man is a warrior because if he's willing to practice edge in this way, I know if, if we ever needed edge in a very evolutionary way of warring tribes, he would be there in a moment and grounded in it. And then the question about what if a woman isn't inspired by masculine passion? I think if a woman's really disconnected from her own passion, her own feminine passion, her own softer wants, needs, desires, that is that is really clamping down on her energy to be able to respond to you. Uh, it's almost like the, the sea creature in the ocean and it, they open with the water and respond and then close and she's kind of stuck in this closed position and so her way forward is to also touch into a little bit of herself because with her own blinders on she can't respond to the gift that's being given to her and what might motivate her to desire to touch in with her own self why not just stay closed that can be really tough because sometimes staying closed feels a lot safer it feels like a, a conservation of energy it feels like a way to protect herself and on the the triangle we saw the you know the framework where, where masculine frame is there part of the masculine frame is adding words into the space that help the feminine kind of find her way in the dark so it might be adding in the word desire. It might be adding in the wor words like deepest need. It might be adding in the words uh, or the question, is it, what is the biggest pain here? And I, and I know with the poster, like I know that you've done a lot with this. It, it feels like she needs more repeated framing words to even find her own language. Hmm. To find her own language. Yeah, because that's how women grow and change. They often don't give themselves permission to be something unless it, they're reflected back to themselves, unless they hear the similar story in another woman who offers her compassion or even the masculine in her life offers some new and different words for her to think about her current experience. You want to come in and say more? You have a question from there. I don't think it's a question as much as it is a statement, which is to say that what I've learned is you you can't give to others what you can't already give to yourself. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a difficult time loving yourself, you're going to have a really difficult time loving others. If you if you feel like you're passionless in your own life, it's going to be difficult for you to, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to celebrate the passion that others are sharing with you. Yeah. Uh, or or maybe what they're just enjoying themselves that they wish you would join in on. And so I probably sound like a broken record to you guys by now because I've, I've said this so many times. But I think it's I, I think that m my situation is is rooted a lot in, frankly, in my wife's dissatisfaction with her own life. And that's not to say that I'm perfect. Of course, I'm not. I still got a lot of challenges in front of me. But I've done a lot more work than she has, you know, so I feel like, you know, I've, I've come a long way in that regard. And and I think it shows and how and how I show up for myself and how I show up for her and how I show up for my kids and, you know, even friends of mine. And I just think that she's having a really still having a really difficult time defining much of anything for herself. And I feel powerless because as much as I've tried to help her encourage her, inspire her, not just with what I do and how, what actions I'm taking for myself, which I hope would reflect on her, but to try and pinpoint what I believe to be her biggest challenges and say, hey, I'm here for you and leave myself open for her. And I failed. I failed at that. Now, whether that's my fault or whether that's her not meeting me halfway, I don't know. But, you know, I feel really stuck and and frustrated not with her but probably for her sure. because of all this but of course my, my dilemma is that the truth is it affects my marriage it affects my relationship with her and it affects my ability to relate to her and after you know years of that you know we get to a conversation which i i kind of dread which is do i want to be in a relationship with someone who won't commit 
themselves to uh, finding a way to becoming better. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's, man, that's tough. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. Not to say that I'm there, but if it ever came to that, it would be the most difficult decision of my life, I think. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So if I may, I, I try to be as practical as possible. And what I'm hearing is that you're in this third stage of invite. And I'm saying this for everyone that's watching. If, if you've never seen this before, you've been building your masculine frame throughout time. You've been learning how to offer her emotional safety, care for her, the words, and you've tried leading. And so you said you want her to be committed to be better. What does better mean? And, and the specific question I want to get to is, what would you like to see her do in action? What would you actually see that you would think, oh yeah, she's beginning to be better or commit to being better for her own self, at least? What's something you'd like to see her do? I think that there has to be a fundamental shift in anyone who's ex who's suffering in life to realize that it, it's, it's all... It's all a matter of how you choose to look at what's going on, right? You have, and we talk about this all the time, you have choices to make. You know, a loved one gets cancer and dies in six months. That sucks. But how are you going to choose to respond to that? Uh, so what I mean is, I think that what I would like to see is a fundamental shift in my wife where instead of searching for happiness, which she does all the time, like comparison is the thief of joy for her. And she does it, I think, instinctually at this point where she doesn't even, it's like subconscious. Mm. And she'll say things out loud or she'll act in certain ways where it's extremely clear that that's what she's doing. And it's like I'm watching her watch her own life go by in this emotional or mental state of like despair or mild depression even because she thinks that happiness is outside of her mm -hmm. and she can't come to realize that it's actually inside of it's in, inside of her and how she's choosing to respond to things that she feels like are holding her back or that she's ashamed of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that of course, that, I, I hear what you're saying. That absolutely makes sense. So if you were to drill all that down, so there's the humanistic approach of I feel your emotions. I validate your emotions. This call Rogers, I can get into the pool of shit with you. And here we are where I'm trying to be vulnerable with you. But if the other person isn't wanting to be vulnerable or close themselves down, okay, then we get to the, then we get to behavioral therapy. Behavioral is what would you break it down to the very tiniest thing? So if I'm you and I feel like I'm leading and offering safety and feel good in my life. And I'm living by example of finding happiness coming from within me and the wisdom of if someone dies in six months and all these things, if I feel like I'm leading and I'm not ready to, let's say, give up, I would break it down to, I want her to say X, Y, Z, which seems ridiculous, but it's down to the point of where I would say something like, do me a favor, say this say, even though such and such, I'm going to find a way to be happy today, or I'm going to smile today, or do this, come over here, hug me, breathe deeply. Let me see some joy in your face down to the almost ridiculous level. And when I say that to most guys, they usually say, well, I don't want to have to do that, Jeff. I don't want to have to train her in that kind of way. That seems ridiculous. She's an adult. She needs to come to this own realization of her own self. And for every man watching, if you want her to come to her own realizations, what needs to happen? More suffering. I think we all know that the only way we come to our own realizations is through suffering. And so if you're not willing to back off and allow her, so to speak, to suffer more, what's the other option? The other option is to tell her what you see to the most basic level is actually going to be on the right path of growth and positivity. And if she fights you there, what's the only choice left to allow her to suffer? Step back. Okay. So with all that said, what would you add to that? What would you say is ne is necessary or is that a terrible idea? I'd love to, love to hear your opinion. Well, gosh, I mean, I felt like this wave of like, oh, that yes, like suffering does make an intense difference. And there's part of me that wants to protect the feminine from all suffering, However, if there is grounded, stable, redwood masculine energy in front of a woman that's inviting her on a way out and she absolutely refuses, the only option is for her to feel 
maybe even her own masculine suffering. Uh, the the uh, has to be in contact with some of the emptiness, the open space that she needs to fill in herself with her own feminine joy. And then the second thing is, what a brilliant thing to say, starting a sentence or asking her to start a sentence with, even though I feel this way, I blank. Because one thing that women, the feminine will do a lot is if they don't feel like the current experience has an expression or they just have to push it away right away, they'll fight against it, they'll hold on to it like for dear life. So those phrases like even though is a, a wonderful hack if she's willing to allow, oh, there's acceptance of where I am and no one's making me take it away. But then there's also this pathway forward. So what are you hearing there? I'm curious, please. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And I think I try that, but I think I do the talking for her. And I think if I heard Cynthia correct, it's force her to do the talking so that she can kind of comprehend it. So she just went through like a breakup with a friend and she thought it was this big betrayal. And it probably was to some extent, but she was like heartbroken over it. And and the friend was being a, a dick. <laughs> she was this, this other friend of hers was to blame because I know the situation. And so I kind of told her, I said, think about it this way. You don't want people like that in your life. So you found out about it the way you did, which sucks. But now you know what the truth is. You know where you stand with this person. And you know, as well as I do, you don't need or want people like that in your life. So it's actually a blessing when you think about it, because you found out it wasn't a deep friendship. It could have been. It was kind of, you know, they were getting to be really good friends, and then this happened. And so now she's out of her life. And so that, that would be a great introduction in a situation where I say, well, start your sentence and tell me what you're feeling and, and start it with something like you said, even though I feel this way. And then maybe she would acknowledge, even though I feel like like crap about this, it's okay. Like it's the current situation and, you know, I'll deal with it. But at least I know that I don't need or want to be friends with that person anymore because that's not my circle. Yeah, that that's well said. So how would you do that in practice? I would look at the stages of grief and I would give time to each one of the stages of grief, right? So anybody watching this, don't just try to shove that down her throat. <laughs> so it's all the other things first, but yeah, where you are, the advanced space where the, you are offering her acceptance and emotional openness and time, time, time over days and weeks and look at those stages of grief. Then you might get to the point of, okay, what are some words to help my woman move on? Or what do I want her to, what do I want her to join me in the kind of life, the kind of values that we espouse, right? Positivity and moving forward and connection and openness. Yeah. That's what I would say there. Yeah. And let's go ahead and step forward. So raise her affection in your marriage. I want to give you the three takeaways we always give you on these calls. Oh, and if you want to be a part of these calls, these are free here on Tuesdays, which they are as the time of this recording. Go to our website, greatmenmovemountains.com, punch in your email address so you can get notices of these free calls and the book that we're working on right now when that starts to come out and our new teaching videos. And we've got other resources on our website, greatmenmovemountains.com. Okay, number one. Now I'm going back to baseline. How do I grow masculinity? How do I grow the polarity in the relationship? And number one is you must be practiced and continuing to practice present moment acceptance. So this is the, the Buddhist idea of coming into this moment and can I have radical acceptance of what's going on, which that could be a whole call in and of itself. So welcome what's happening. Number two, you must be able to emotionally regulate yourself and how to do that and when to do that are things that we teach as well. And we've talked about other times. So you have to be able to welcome what's happening and keep your shit together. This is going to help her feel your masculinity. And I don't mean just stuff your emotions down. You come here, you talk to us about it, you journal, you pray, you go to your male friends, right? You work on these things, but in front of her, so to speak, you can't just lose your mind and be the martyr or the neediness as we were saying earlier. So welcome what's happening and keep your shit together in the moment. And number three, you must have value-based action. What are my values in the world? What's important to me? How do I want to be bringing who I am into the world? And what's the next best thing to do? So doing the next best thing. These are the three pieces. If you don't know how to do these, email me, reach out to us, post in the forum, ask questions on the next call, right? So welcome what's happening. Be able to emotionally regulate and keep your shit together in the moment, usually by talking less, okay? <laughs> 
and then doing the next best thing for yourself based on your values in the world. And Thich Nhat Hanh, he passed away in 2022. He was 95 years old, this Vietnamese Buddhist monk. He's a peace advocate, one of my favorite authors in that genre as well. It says, it's not impermanence that makes us suffer. What makes us suffer is wanting things to be permanent when they are not. And that's a whole form of acceptance. Mm -hmm. So Cynthia, what are your last, your some final words today on this call? What are you seeing from this topic and the uh, level three idea of polarity and attraction, please? Yeah, I, I chuckle because I've heard it before, of course, it, uh, the, it means talk less. And I was chuckling of the, because that's so to me, masculine presence of the awareness and watching and allowing others to explore, explore open. And if we're talking about polarity today and, and just diving into what we just spoke about, so much of the feminine energy gets stuck actually in, in the throat. And this might feel totally different if, if, you feel like you're with a woman who's very like a, has a lot of verbal skills and a lot of assertiveness in that way. But we're talking about femininity, really opening and learning how to open herself to you and this the incredible space you provide. It is an encouragement of her speaking more of moving that energy out of her. And when she feels your present moment acceptance with that, your emotional self-regulation and you know, doing the next best thing, it is the safety net that can open her in that way. So we should talk about that next time is what do you mean by energy stuck in the throat and moving of energy and the, the different archetypes of women, right? Some are more fiery and some are more closed down. We could talk about that next time. It's yeah. a good topic. Awesome. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks. Again, reach out to us guys. We'll see you next time.